All right. Hi, everyone. This is kind of really quickly. I'm going to do a review of what we would have uh, talked about on Tuesday. I know you guys uh, were examining leads, uh, what makes a story, who, what, when, where, and why. This is just I said, a quick review um, and in case you guys have questions about it, um, this is what this is for. So who, what, when, where, why, and how are the basic uh, questions you have to answer on when doing a uh, story, especially a lead. Yeah. So this is the inverted pyramid. Oops, let me go back. These are the vocabulary you'll need to know. The lead is the first sentence. It captures the reader's attention and tells them what the story is about in the sentence. These are things you should have covered in uh, Grammar for Journalists, but just in case uh, you forgot, there it is. Uh, the nut graph is the second sentence, sometimes the third, uh, that gives more information on the story that wasn't being covered in the lead. So like I said, attention grabbing sentence, first sentence, because you got to get the readers, especially today. And then the nut graph gives you more information. So uh, below that, you have more detailed information followed by quotes, so if additional information, that sort of thing. Um, since this is a video, I'm going to go super fast, and I apologize for that. But you can always pause, take notes, that sort of thing. All right, so this is the inverted pyramid. Ta -da! Okay, it has the most important information at the top. The who is the story about? What is the story about? When did it happen? Where did it take place? Why is it important and how? Uh, the main thing to remember is when you're thinking of a story, the question that you have to ask yourself is why should I care? Why should the public care about this story? Um, it depends, and depending on the, the outlet you're writing for or working for, um, they may take it or they may not. It just depends altogether. Um, then, of course, you have the important details about the who, what, where, when, and why. And then, of course, like I said, other quotes, other colorful details. All right. So, this is a report. This is a lead. New Mexico teen had homicidal, su homicidal suicidal thoughts. Okay, that's the first sentence. This is the headline here. Uh, this is, oh, it should be the Associated Press just one time. <laughs> um, and this is the lead. Um, we'll talk about datelines at a later time. Right now we're just focusing on the lead. But just FYI, the dateline is um, where the story took place. So, uh, this is the lead that Miss Bryan has. The New Mexico teenager accused of fatally shooting his parents and three younger siblings told authorities he was annoyed with his mother and had been having homicidal and suicidal thoughts according to a probable, probable cause statement. Excuse me. Um, so right here, very simply, we say where this story took place in New Mexico. Um, who is it about? It's about this teenager who was accused of fatally shooting his parents. Now, we say accused of fatally shooting because at this point in time, According to the law, he is uh, innocent until proven guilty. Okay. Um, until he's convicted by a court of law, he still has he's still innocent. So to kind of cover yourself as a reporter, you usually say alleged or accused. Okay, that's what you do right here. Alleged is a nicer word, but she used accused. Um, who else is the story about? The three siblings. Why he did it? He was annoyed and he was having homicidal thoughts. So this kind of gives you the entire motivation as to what happened and why it happened in one sentence. Okay, I'm not saying do a run-on sentence, never do those. Those are very annoying. You don't want that. But it's a well-constructed sentence. It has everything all together. The next sentence after this would probably say, you know, what's going to happen to the teen or maybe give a little bit of background as to what led up to the incident. And there we go. We don't know the teen's name in the nut graph, so let me go back over here. We don't know the teen's name in the sentence, in the lead, I'm sorry. But in the nut graph, we find out who he is. Nehemiah Grego, 15, remained in custody Monday on charges of murder and child abuse resulting in death. He was arrested following the shooting Saturday at a home in a rural area southwest of Albuquerque where he lived with his family. This is a nut graph. This gives you more information, tells you his name, and the details about him. That's what a nut graph is. This is not a lead because it's it's too uh, 
it's just it's too detailed for one and two it's not giving us enough information as to when and why and how it happened where the lead actually does all of that then of course you have more details this is the rest of the story gives you information about the county sheriffs when they questioned him um, how the details were spelled out the teen tells detectives according to them that he had a 22 caliber rifle that's a lot of details there um, what he did how he did it um, and then he's accused of then shooting his two younger sisters in the room received an AR so he used a 22 caliber rifle and then an AR-15 so he had both um, so this is kind of wrapping up to be a pretty good story the statement said he shot his father multiple times more details as he passed the bathroom doorway so it just continues um, and you would find out more details about the case maybe if there's any quotes you would put in a quote here maybe there and this is where you'd have maybe the Bern Bernalillo County Sheriff quoting something that maybe they saw the crime scene you know and uh, or maybe you talk to the lawyer of the accused and get that quote so what makes the leap the shorter the better it's about 25 words or less uh, that's an estimate sometimes you want to shoot for 35 because that's how much you need uh, there's always exceptions a feature story allows for a more detailed lead what we just saw was a news lead and here we go summary lead combines all five W's in one sentence which was the news lead that we saw just now delayed ID lead also you can combine the kinds of leads there are these are just different kinds and then you have anecdotal leads Okay, um, anecdotal leads can work from time to time and it depends on the story they usually work for features sometimes they work for news stories okay there's a scene setter again lacks urgency this is more for feature and magazine pieces direct address directly addresses the reader kinda of like a blog and then blind leads we're not gonna be doing this uh, gives reader a tease by withholding information. Please avoid these until... See, basically you have to learn all the rules of journalism and grammar before you can break them. When you've learned them all and you've become a professional at them, then you can do these. And then the startling statement, you want to try and avoid these. Okay. Uh, one example is a shortage of flu vaccines will lead thousands of vulnerable to what can become a deadly virus. That's kind of scary. Okay. So it's, it's scary. <laughs> Here's some leads to avoid. Roundup lead. You start with an anecdote or an example and then tie it back to the end. I mean, this is done a lot in literature, but you want to avoid that for now. Wordplay leads. Just avoid them right now because it just kind of it's not professional. Um, question leads. They're weak and ineffective. Shows that the writer was lazy. Topic leads. You see these in a lot of government stories. This is usually due to time restraints, but if you can, avoid them if possible. So, I said that, but here. We'll go over this on Tuesday. Don't bury the lead. So, this is what I see a lot of um, usually when we first start, and then it gets better. Um, keep the most important, relevant, and new, updated, and timely information at the top first two sentences. I should know what the story is about or get a really good idea of what the story is about or what I'm going to be read about in the first two sentences. You don't want to bury it. Uh, you will lose the reader if you bury it. So here's an example of burying the lead. Frances Hiller, 42, left to roam through the grasslands of the prairie. She had done this ever since she was a little girl. This is nice. I guess this is going to be a story about Mrs. Hiller, right? Like maybe about her grasslands. The wind against her face always made her smile. Oh, very nice. All that love of the prairie came to a jolting halt when she died on Saturday. What? Police said Hiller died when a 30-year-old man allegedly murdered her with a blunt object while she was sleeping inside her home. Whoa. So we just learned that this woman, Mrs. Hiller, is dead. It takes me one, two, three, four. It takes me five sentences to get there. Whoa, that is totally missing the story. This needs to be at the top. A 42-year-old woman was murdered by a 32-year-old man by a blunt object while she was asleep. 
Then details about the crime that you can find out, details about the subject and the suspect that was uh, allegedly charged in the murder. And then you can go into, like friends and family said, Francis Hill, I'd love to run through the grasslands of blah, blah, blah. Okay. This is more important. Why? Because it's murder. Somebody just died. And murder is a heinous crime. And so that's why it needs to be at the top. This is really dark, and I'm sorry, but this is the industry that you're getting into, guys. <laughs> um, the rest of the story, nut graph, we've already done this. And then always remember this. Keep it simple. And it's kind of... Mm, you want to keep the details simple and explain things as if you're explaining it to Abuelita or your grandma. Okay, But you don't want to completely take out facts and completely take out information that might be pertinent to the story. Okay, You need to also avoid cliches, which are also kind of hard to do. There's so many today. All right, so here's some information. This is what a story comprises of. You have your sources, of course, where you get the information, the people you quote, the data you collect. Uh, sometimes your editor gives you information, cooperation, lawsuits, affidavits, etc. Okay. You need all this information to put one story together. Sometimes you have too much information. And accuracy. We're kind of going to go over this on Tuesday again, but only write what you can confirm as hard evidence. Okay, If you hear about a story, there are some facts and there are rumors and you can't clarify or verify the rumors, then don't put them in there. Maybe use it as a string as a way to maybe get more information. But if you have a deadline and all you have is rumor, then don't put it in there. Okay. Uh, this applies to future stories. I'm going to give you an example of how accuracy is so important. Okay. Locally, Angie Gomez. Let's talk about Angie Gomez. All right. So Angie Gomez uh, was a Horizon High School student, I believe, or Clint. See, I don't even remember. <laughs> um, I believe it was Horizon. She lived in Horizon, and. Apparently, she, this uh, young teenager, had cancer. And she told everyone that she had cancer. A teacher, sometimes she'd be absent. And because she had cancer, a lot of teachers gave her a lot of leeway. Um, assignments would be sent to her. And she got deadlines that were pushed. She said that she had an advanced form of cancer, that she was being um, treated at chemotherapy, and she had to go to these sessions. Uh, People said that uh, her parents and her had a falling out. That's kind of the first red flag. And then it went on to say that um, when she was, you know, when they were doing stories about her, uh, people said that Miss Gomez was being dropped off at the hospital to get her treatments by a friend and then picked up later after they were done. Okay. What people didn't realize is that Miss Gomez actually did not have cancer. Um, she was being dropped off at the hospital, yes. People would see her walk in, but then would not go in with her. So she'd walk in, maybe walk around, and then walk out. The other thing she would do also is what made it such a big story is, you see this here, okay? They were actually having a fundraiser for her. <coughs> and on top of having a fundraiser for her where she had the money and she got the money, they made her her own special prom. She was unable to go to prom because she couldn't afford the money for a prom dress. And that brought tears to people's eyes. And so the school went and uh, looked for donors. And they found donors to give her a prom dress. And I'm not talking about like, you know, dresses from Ross. I'm talking about Macy's and that sort of thing. And so she had a whole rack full of prom dresses. So she had her own prom. Uh, the story was done about her. The reporter, you know, reported these stories about her and and what school is doing. And then guess what, guys? Little red flag started to pop up. And when they had fundraisers for her, her parents were never around. That's kind of weird. You have a kid that has cancer and your parents aren't around. But maybe there was a falling out. Or maybe the parents weren't just good parents. Okay, maybe. That's kind of weird still. And the whole story about her being dropped off, but nobody following her into the... Uh, the hospital. That's another red flag. And then uh, the uh, oh my gosh, Make a Wish Foundation came to her. They found out about her, and she put in an application saying that her wish was to get her four years of college paid for. Hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that someone with cancer isn't going to make it through four years of college, but that's kind of a weird wish. 
Usually the Make-A-Wish Foundation is about, let's do this awesome big wish, you know, for this kid that may not make it. Let's make their dreams come true. And Miss Gomez was like, pay for all my four years of college. Okay. So that raised a red flag. Several. And then come to find out, she didn't have cancer. And her parents had no idea this was going on, which I don't know about that. And then she just disappeared. Um, she was charged at, criminally in court. And there was just a lot of things that the reporter missed. And they just got swept up in the story of this great student with cancer and turns out never had cancer. Okay. Other elements, not, not as big as this, but yeah, you got to do this is super essential, especially today. Um, correct spelling of names, which talked about already. Uh, and then I'm going to go through this here. This is more evident. This is what news is. And we've talked about this in your textbook. Okay. And we're going to not go through that right now. That's for later. Okay, so that is what news is. The next thing we want to talk about is quotes. Okay, being accurate. Now, we're going to go over this a little bit. Uh, over the quotes. Oh, I'm gonna bombard you with this, I'm sorry. But this is mostly for your assignment, okay? So I talked about leads, quotes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so the way we do quotes in news is we have a certain format. We have the paraphrase and the quote quotes, okay? The direct quotes. A paraphrase is taking a quote and simplifying it and making sure it's accurate. So, for example, actually, let's, let's get a little political here just because I saw this in the news. This is a made-up person. This is a made-up quote. <laughs> Speaking of accuracy, right? Because that's a direct quote, a really bad quote. But you get the idea. To paraphrase this, you would say, find out his age, say he's 18, or 28, sure. All right, so I didn't quote in here. I find out some information about my, my source. And he's inspired or really likes that Beto works can skateboard. So here he says a bunch of stuff. And here he just, I just say that Via said he saw a work skateboarding at the Waterburger parking lot. This one sentence covers everything here. Paraphrasing is good when you want um, to save space. It's also good when you want to make your um, source sound intelligent. A lot of people, especially like in courtrooms, um, especially if they're the defense or their witnesses, uh, may not 
speak accurately or or well or they or they speak uh, with a lot of assumptions and so you have to kind of be able to filter that uh, and also you don't want to um, you want them to sound intelligent, like they know what they're doing. So here's, we're going to go more into the detail on that on Tuesday. Um, but I want you to do this, transcribing in quotes. So number one rule in quoting people and getting quotes, record, record, record. These are the rules, okay? Always record because some and, and make sure you have batteries and make sure your recorder is working. Other two things, okay, to know. Batteries. Mm. Oh, and this is the other thing. <laughs> make sure you hit record and uh, play. That has happened, guys. Okay, you, it might be funny. Um, but there, there have been incidents when the reporters are just in such a rush that they hit uh, play instead of record. Sorry, that was uh, one of my faculty members. Um, so yeah, record, record. Now, how do you transcribe things? All right, um, you're gonna hear a really loud no noise, and I apologize. How you transcribe things, guys. I'm going to go to a video and I'll show you what I mean by transcribing. When you're transcribing quotes, you get the quote, and then um, after you transcribe the quote, I'm sorry, you get the quote, you do the interview, you go back, and you transcribe. Make sure it's accuracy. So I'm going to give you an example of a how to transcribe a quote. Let me see if I can get. Something for my freelance career here. Um. Theo Harris, T H E O H A R I. So, both Reverend Barbara and I are the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign. A national. Okay, I'm gonna find a different one because that the the voice is kind of hard. There, it's a recording. Here we go. Okay. So this is the Border Network for Human Rights Director, Fernando Garcia. It's in English. I'm sorry, that's in Spanish. <laughs> Let's find a big one. Come on. Let's do the press conference. Uh, we have a delegation coming from several parts of the country, but also community members. And who are you representing here today? So what I usually do, I'm going to go ahead and get the press conference because I think that has the uh, the best. Uh, come on, the best sound, so that you can kind of see what's going on there. All right, where is uh I'm gonna say done. I'm gonna get a text file. So this is how transcribing works. Okay. 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 
vote by Fortnite, which is a member of the Four People's Campaign. Uh, we have a delegation coming from several parts of the country, but also community members from southern New Mexico and El Paso. And between yesterday and today, uh, we've been having events to showcase and to uh, demonstrate that communities of color can come together. Uh, one of the key border communities, all of these things that we're seeing, it is part of this national larger struggle. Because what is happening to immigrants today? The persecution, the criminalization, the separation of families. Okay, you see what I'm doing there? Persecution, the criminalization, and the separation of families. Families. It is not only happening to immigrants, it is also happening to other communities. Ah, not only it, happening. They are sister. It is not only happening to immigrants, it's happening to other communities. So, you get the idea here. That criminalize us all, well, whether you are a person of color in Chicago, or a young black man in Chicago, or if you are a young dreamer in El Paso, in New Mexico, you have the same aspirations and the same connections to happening to other communities. They are systems that criminalize us all, well, whether you are a person of color in Chicago, or, or, or a young black man in Chicago, or if you are a young dreamer in El Paso, in New Mexico, you have the same aspirations and the same connections unfair systems. So you get the idea. Okay. This is transcribing. You get the recording, you go back and you do exactly what it did there. And as you see, I had to go back a couple times and add a few things, especially here in the, the second part here. Um, and, and you have to do that because you need to maintain accuracy. Otherwise you might miss a couple things or you might misquote somebody. So your assignment. Let's get to that. Okay, and it'll be there. Interview somebody. I gave you a set of questions. You can start off with those five and then kind of veer off and do your own thing. Um, maybe you find an interview E that's um, interesting. 15 minutes minimum interview. 30 minutes max. Once you get the interview, you have to record, okay, and then transcribe your interview. Okay, that's what I want for you. Interview somebody. If you want to interview your parents, that's fine. If you want to interview your family member, I nothing specific here. I just want you to get into the act of interviewing people. Uh, if you want to be bold and interview somebody that you don't know, um, one, be cautious. If it's a stranger off the street, I don't recommend that. But <laughs> uh, maybe a friend or a friend of a friend, you can do that too. Um, so that's what I want. Um, you will be able to find this assignment on Canvas. And we will talk more about accuracy transcribing on Tuesday. We will meet face-to-face -face on Tuesday. I will see you face-to-face -face on Tuesday. Everything will go back to normal. <laughs> I'm so sorry that this has been a crazy first week. Um, but thank you for being understanding, although I'm sure you're okay with it. Okay, if you guys have any questions, concerns, I need to grade your stuff, by the way. That is my cell phone. Call or text me, okay? Uh, I'm good with the texting. Uh, I think I've answered pretty much everyone that's contacted me. If I haven't, keep bugging me, okay? All right, guys, uh, that's it. Thank you for being understanding, and have a good weekend. See you on Tuesday. In class. <laughs> Pick a spell. There we go. <laughs>